Hello, my name is Declan O'Dempsey and I'm about to give you a short presentation on the new presidential uh, practice direction that's been issued concerning how to issue a claim in the employment tribunals on or after the 29th of July 2013. So the, present, uh, the presidential practice direction on the presentation of claims was issued on the 26th of July 2013 and it comes into effect on and from 29th of July 2013. It sets out the methods by which a completed form may be presented and it refers to Rule 8 as its basis and I'll come back to the implications of that later. In the rules and in the practice direction, a claim is any proceedings before an employment tribunal making a complaint, and a complaint is anything referred to as a com claim, complaint, reference, application or appeal in any enactment uh, which uh, gives the um, employment tribunals jurisdiction. There are three methods of starting a claim and they have slightly different uh, nuances applying to them. The first is online, the second by post and the third in person. Turning to starting the claim online, there is an online form submission service and you can see that by going to the Employment Tribunal Service website the additional information which was attached to the presidential practice direction says that the online system will assist in calculating the fee which is due. It's also recommended as the best way of starting a claim because it will ensure that a claimant does remember to pay or apply for remission. This is because the online service will not allow the claim to be submitted unless the fee is paid or an application is made for remission of fees. And thirdly, the online submission service will ensure that the fee reaches the processing centre very quickly. The notes also recommend it because it leaves no room for doubt when the claim was presented as that's recorded electronically. And this may be important, as it says, if the claim is being presented close to the end of the limitation period. The second method is to start by post. And there's an address in uh, Leicester that's given. It's the Employment Tribunal Central Office for England and Wales. Note that there is only one address to which postal um, submissions can be sent. Lastly, there is the method of starting the claim in person. So you're entitled to present the claim in person at one of a number of employment tribunal offices listed in the schedule. You're only entitled to do that, however, within tribunal business hours, which are given in the practice direction as 9am to 4pm, Monday to Friday, not including public holidays or weekends. I'm next going to display the addresses. These are set out in a list in the schedule. It's a list that's broken down by the existing regions. So you should simply pick the nearest office in this list to you in order to present your claim in person. I said earlier that um, I would refer again to Rule 8 of the Tribunal Rules. Rule 8 requires the claimant to use the prescribed form and to observe the practice direction which has now been issued. So 
The practice direction applies only to England and Wales and there are different rules that will apply for when a claim can be presented in Scotland. And those differences in rules may be important for some questions of jurisdiction. I want to say something about the consequences of failing to present the claim in, in accordance uh, with the practice direction. The additional information to the practice direction actually uh, refers only to the uh, rejection of a claim for not being accompanied by the relevant fee or application for remission. Um, it states correctly that for the purposes of the time limit, which applies to the presentation of the claim, time carries on running and the consequence of that we'll see in a moment. The rules about rejection are worth bearing in mind. They're at rules 10 to 12 and the tribunal must reject the claim if it's not on the prescribed form or if it doesn't have each of the claimant's name and address and each of the respondent's names and addresses. Secondly, if it's not accompanied by the fee or remission application, that's rule 11. And thirdly, um, the tribunal staff can refer the claim to the judge who will make a decision um, and reject the claim or parts of the claim where the judge considers that there's no jurisdiction for the tribunal or that it's an abusive process or that it cannot sensibly be responded to. So what happens if you pay the fee but it's less than it ought to be? Well, the tribunal will send a, a notice of the date by which the full fee should be paid. Failure to do that means the claim or part of it in respect of which the full fee has not been paid uh, will be rejected by the tribunal. If you've made an application for remission but the application fails wholly or partly, then the tribunal sends you a notice specifying the date for payment of the tribunal fee and the claim is going to be rejected if that fee is not paid by that date. Let's turn now to uh, rejection and reconsideration. What happens is that the form is returned to the claimant with notice of rejection explaining why it was rejected. You can see the various rules. When the papers have been put in front of the judge who's uh, rejected the whole or part of the claim uh, for the reasons set out in 12.3, then the judge's reasons will be set out in the notice of rejection. The notice will also contain information about how to apply for reconsideration, save um, if the problem is that the fee is absent. Next, um, there will be reconsideration if the claimant applies in writing, giving reasons why the rejection was wrong uh, and, or alternatively, rectifying the defect. If the claimant wants a hearing, the written application must ask for it, and if one happens, then only the claimant need attend. If the claimant doesn't seek a hearing, or the judge accepts that the claim uh, should be accepted in full, the judge determines the application without a hearing. But if the judge decides that the original rejection was correct, but the defect has been rectified, then the claim is treated as presented on the date that the defect was rectified, and that's by virtue of Rule 13.4. So in addition to the point in the additional information in the practice direction, even if the defect is rectified, it's the later date of rectification that will be the presentation date. And remember, presented has now received a definition in Rule 1. It means delivered. Now that reflects the previous practice, but it wasn't defined uh, in the old rules.